we're going to be talking about first. <clears throat> so right here we're going to be doing me and uh, what do I call you? Max? What? John Baptiste? No, uh, not you, Max. I was referring to uh, Thirsty Fox. Should I just call you Thirsty Fox? Oh uh, yeah, you should just yeah. call me uh, Fox or Thirsty. Just <laughs> make it easy. <laughs> Alright, so Jean Baptiste and Max are going to be talking about conservatism and why we need a government from the conservative point of view and me and Thirsty Fox, I'm Filthy Heretic by the way, are going to be replying to that on why we do not need a government. Oh, yep. I... Sound about right? Uh, Jean doesn't appear to have returned, however. That's all right. No, I'm, no, here. I'm here. Okay, good. Uh, so, who do you who should start? Uh, Max, uh, what should I call you? <laughs> go ahead. Max is fine. Max and John Baptiste from Red Co Religion will go ahead and mirror this um, on our channel at some point if it goes well, and uh, we're glad to be here. We talk about these issues all the time. A number of members of the Red Co Religion team and fan base are various types of anarchists, and we actually don't impose uh, on our membership or even the people who work with us a specific point of view. So, but you know, so we have anarcho-communists, we have anarcho-capitalists, we have libertarians, we have conservatives. About the only thing we don't have is too many postmodernists. But uh, that's what we do on Red Pro Religion. I myself am, am Catholic. I am a former liberal, former leftist, former libertarian, former, I, I don't even know what the word conservative means anymore. Well, I, that was actually going to be the first thing I asked you. Sorry to interrupt. That's all right. Um, so yeah, what I, I'm not quite sure what a conservative is. The way I see it is is that um, ultimately, what Western civilization, as we understand it, the, the the legal system is ultimately based on something called natural law, um, which goes back to Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle and others. Heck, there's even pagans who follow. Aristotelian natural law, um, and I believe that uh, what 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 we can say is that you know to love him or hate him, uh, Jordan Peterson uh, has made the point extremely well uh, that that it appears that nature itself, along with human beings, appear to naturally form hierarchies. I know that uh, Jordan Peterson, for example, gets mocked, for example, by for noting that lobsters, uh, uh, you know, often fall into a hierarchical pattern in nature. Because he was just using that as an example, because you see these natural hierarchies everywhere in, in, in nature. You see it among humans. And, and it, you know, if you, if you want to go into the Bible, which not everybody wants to, but you see the Bible doesn't necessarily proclaim hierarchies exactly so much as embrace them kind of note that they're there for a reason. When I look through all of history, I, I want to be an anarchist. I really do. Uh, when I look at all of history and various societies, I would love to be an anarchist. I think I would be somewhere between a, an anarcho-communist and, and an anarcho-capitalist, simply because I think some things should be bought and sold and some things should not be. But in the final analysis, when I look at the reality of human beings, whether you go with psychology or the spiritual, a certain percentage of human beings is um, naturally sociopathic or narcissistic. These are anywhere between 2% and 20% of the population, depending on how you measure it and where you look. And even among people who aren't like that, um, there will always be a certain percentage of people who will gather enough money and, weapon and weaponry and followers to take and destroy whatever they want. So that whenever you establish your, your, com your anarchist society, no matter how you uh, structure it, uh, eventually, sooner or later, the minute you have something that somebody, your community or collection of individuals, whatever you put it, the minute you are in the way of something that, that powerful people with no conscience and who don't share your values want what you want, or want to get you out of their way, or simply decide to destroy you, they will. Thus, we've seen throughout history people establish kingdoms or other forms of government so that they may be banded together for mutual protection. 
the United States may have been founded in the 1700s uh, under, under a loosely, what you might call loosely anarchic society with the idea that you're going to have, you know, militias and individuals standing up to defend their, their territories and their homes and their families and such. But larger imperial powers of one type or another always come in to destroy such people unless you respond uh, by setting up structures yourself. So to me, anarchism cannot work. We have to accept, I'm almost done, we have to accept that uh, human beings have a need for hierarchy and order. A certain number of people, a certain percentage of the population will never go along with whatever ethic or, uh, you know, metaphysical or ethical structure you, you put together. So in the end, no matter what, unless you're down to a society of one, um, no matter what, you're going to wind up compromising and accepting the authorities of others. So I, I simply think anarchism of any kind is impossible. And I think, therefore, we must find uh, governing solutions for large amounts of people um, to basically enforce whatever norms our society has found acceptable. I simply don't see how anarchism can work. And I think that's all I have to say. All right. Now, my reply is going to be, what is it that we are looking for? Not just me and Thirsty Fox, but you and I. What we want is a lawful, <clears throat> a lawful, orderly society in which people abide by certain objective rules that are clear, that are well-defined, and this is preferable. In fact, I would go so far as to say it's universally preferable. Everybody here wants to be able to do whatever they want, to do whatever it is that they find desirable, as long as they're not hurting anyone without having to worry about being randomly attacked by a maniac. We all agree for this. We all agree that order is desirable and that chaos is not desirable. Towards this end, it makes absolutely no sense at all why we would create a government in order to create a lawful, orderly society because by creating a government, you create a system in which you have one set of rules for one group of people and another set of rules for a different group of people who call themselves a government. After all, in order to prevent people from stealing, they have to first enforce the law which is paid for with money that was stolen from other people. In order to punish people, they have to kidnap. And in order to go to war because for whatever reason they wish, they would have to commit murder. The difference is when private individuals commit murder, they might at best affect one person, a few dozen people at most. Whereas when a government commits murder, they commit murder by the millions. And the entirety of human history in the last 5,500 years has been an unending procession of murder, death, war, starvation, and abject human horror. In the last 100 years, we have seen more people killed because of governments. This is not only counting World War I and World War II, but also counting the various famines and deaths that occurred as a result of Soviet, not just Soviet, but communism and fascism. More people were killed because of their governments in the last 100 years than arguably war in the last 2000. And this, I think, I don't think, I know, is not something that anyone should find universally desirable if their desire is for an orderly society. Nobody should have to be murdered because they broke an arbitrary law or they broke an arbitrary opinion with a gun that legislators called law. Nobody should have to be have 20, 30, 40% of their property taken from them at gunpoint because some guy in a suit with a badge that says IRS calls it taxes. This makes absolutely no sense to me at all and it really shouldn't to anyone else. Uh, one thing I li would like to add to that is uh, a <clears throat> The reason why anarchy is associated with chaos is because of that, like, sudden change of, like, uh, <clears throat> without a government. Like, people become too reliable uh, for a lead leader because, well, 
the uh, the government provides for them basically and if you eliminate that then people are gonna think to themselves oh no I lost uh well my welfare or something like that or because if you like have a sudden change then people are gonna start freaking out but if I guess if we like gradually like uh, reduce the government to where it's like nothing like uh, compete with it or uh, vote against it which I don't believe voting is the best option but like uh yeah, I, I believe that we should compete with the government, but that's not the point. But basically, yeah, people become too dependent on the government to where it becomes violent if you get rid of it. Well, okay. I, I would I would counter that but with one, you can't have an orderly society without something imposing order. You you cannot have something that that with no rules imposing rules it, it's not something that can happen that's that's one of the reasons for the state uh, another reason for government to actually exist isn't necessarily to do harm to you know its own people but to protect its people from harm from other governments so you know for anarchism to truly work you'd have to get rid of all the world's governments because we would still have that problem of okay well if everybody but china became you know became anarchist eventually we'll all just become china well let me let me ask this what do we mean by government in the first place um because the 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 general thrust of this conversation seems to be as if government is something is imposed um i would contend that people naturally seek har uh, um uh, something like what we would call a government. Um, if you even just go into something very, let's say, primitive, like let's say you're in a lawless part of the United States, some part of Los Angeles or Chicago or Detroit where police fear to go, what, what establishes itself there generally? Um, some sort of local toughs, some sort of local street gangs, who rule the territory, usually through violence. Um, if you look through history, people establish tribes, they, they establish, uh, and warlords show up. And all you need to do, I mean, let's say I'm a war, let's say I'm a warlord in Afghanistan right now. I don't need the government's permission to gather a bunch of guns and, and uh, men willing to follow me and work violence and women to support uh, people basically i have all i need to, all i need is guns and the will to do it and enough charisma to get people follow me and i'm i'm automatically a government i'm just a tyrant thug you know i don't have any you know let's say i've got 500 people under me in my little street gang that i've established um i'm part of an anarchist society am i not i'm a street thug uh, I control the streets. I keep the streets safe in my territory because, and it's my territory because I've got the guns and I say it is. And I got the guys and, the, and they say it is. And they follow me because that's the kind of ruler I am. Um, that's the kind of guy I am. And that none of that, none of that would happen through formal systems of law or anything else. It will simply be, call it law of jo the jungle or whatever you want. Um, Men like this will arise no matter what you do. People will follow them no matter what you do. I don't see how you get around that um, unless you have an organized systems with rules where you limit that. I don't see how you do it, guys. I, I, I just think this will naturally arise. It's human nature for there to be some kind of governing authority. We look for it. So I, I don't know how you get where you're talking about. You're kind of filibustering there. I apologize. I'm done. So say what you want. My, I'm think. Give me a moment here. The way I see it, you have. Well, first off, we have to define what a government is, and the simplest definition is that a government is a monopoly on arbitration. In a geographical area, they are the sole authority on defining what is right and wrong and all authority from which right and wrong is derived comes from them. So in the first instance, you have an organization that can basically dictate right and wrong completely arbitrarily. Now what standards they use to define right and wrong are going to differ completely. 
But more importantly, from this monopoly on arbitration, they give themselves a monopoly on the initiation of force, which is why I often refer to the state as a coercive monopoly, which is exactly what it is. But I think you've made my point very spectacularly by identifying that a street gang that controls a territory and is the sole operating force that defines what is right and wrong, namely the might, using the might makes right principle, that a government is little more than a street gang, only applied to an enormous geographical area. Well, I would actually agree with you that functionally that is all a government is. Um, it, 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 it is it, uh, what you call a street gang or an Afghan warlord or an African warlord or whatever you want. Warlordism will arise inevitably, I would argue. It will simply inevitably arise no matter where you are unless you're ready to fight it. That's, that's really what I think will happen. I, I, and I think history bears me out on that. Well, you're, I think what you're worried about is the warlord's problem, which is one of the earlier videos I did. I'll be happy to address that later, but I want to address the principles first. Namely, that the worst case scenario you can come up with in terms of anarchism is that anarchism will eventually develop into a state. In which case, anarchism's pre-state status is vastly more desirable especially since, according to natural law, uh, an anarchist society is universally desirable. I mean, people might not be aware of this consciously, but it's the only, situ it's the only configuration of society that is completely ethical, that doesn't steal people to prevent people from being stolen from, that doesn't commit violence against its own people to, under the guys that it's going to stop other people from committing violence. The only justification you can come up with it is because there are other street gangs when really all that does is just showcase your lack of imagination in figuring out other ways that other organizations might be able to prevent a state. In fact, I'd even go so far as to say that the state is the least equipped at fighting other states. Which is ironic, because the state is really only good at two things. One, committing mass murder, and two, fighting other states. But the truth is that, well, you can look throughout history, most importantly recent history, and find that decentralized, unorganized guerrilla fighters have been vastly more effective, with vastly inferior technology, against vastly more powerful empires coming in. You can see this in... Iraq and Afghanistan, especially Afghanistan, both in the modern Afghani war and the Mujahideen versus the Soviet Union, and of course the United States invasion of Vietnam being excellent examples of how low, or poorly equipped, poorly trained guerrilla fighters can be vastly more effective, especially at defending territory, than an invading army with helicopters, most sophisticated military equipment the world has ever seen, highly trained troops. And I oh, just don't I, see that. I'm sorry, I wasn't. Oh, you know what? Actually, yeah, I was finished. Go ahead. Well, um, for one thing, the, the premise about the Viet Cong is, is incorrect because China did arm the Viet Cong, and the Viet Cong was, uh, did have a structure. They were trying to set up a, a co communist government. Um, with the Mujahideen, they had some kind of structure behind them, they, they had a belief system and. and and all that they were also trying the the whole Taliban thing um, was originally supposed to be this good type of Afghanistan government that turned out not to be. Um, you know, it, it, the, these the, like the Mujahideen were, weren't unorganized. They were they were organized. We we gave them some extra pointers, but for the most part, they had a command structure. And you know they you know, each tribe each each different area they they had a command structure. They had the the leader who who made the uh, plans, and then they had everybody else that would follow, that would implement the plan. Um, so it, it it's even even in in Africa the the you know Nation of Islam is an organization, and they have been pushing for you know taking over governments like in Sudan and stuff like that. 
um, you, you have a, a lot of this conflict that you that isn't being directed by government. It's being directed by ideas. And I think you I think you've actually made another one of my points, namely that although I did say a lot that it's largely unstructured, this isn't completely true that any individual organization, especially in an anarchist society, is going to want some form of organization. But the thing is, you don't need a coercive monopoly for that. People are going to want to do this voluntarily. Like, one of the premises that I think a lot of people get wrong about anarchism is that we're opposed to hierarchy. We're not. We're not at all. We're just opposed to rulers. We're opposed to, we're opposed to people who call themselves a government dictating what percentage of our property belongs to them that they have no legitimate claim to. What we want is for people to associate voluntarily, for people to want to work under somebody because they're a good leader, because they're paying them, because, I don't know, they really like the guy, for whatever reason they wish. Let me uh, let me point out uh, an example that that seems pertinent to me. Um, a, a guy. This is worth writing down. Even a guy named John Perkins, P E R K I N S. A book of his worth reading is called "The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman." Actually, "Confessions of an Economic Hitman" by itself is good, but he has an an updated version called "New Confessions of an Economic Hitman," which is the same stuff plus more. Um, and he's interesting to look into because he worked well he, he was originally trained and there was cooperation with the United States government in the form of the National Security Administration and the CIA but he's published all of the things that he did he worked most of his life in the private sector uh, going in uh, to various countries to take them over. He was part of a three-pronged strategy to take over a country, but, um, and, and, and he was the kind of guy, and he mentions country after country he did this in, like Panama and Ecuador and Indonesia. I mean, real specific places and times where he went and did things, like walk into a president's office, you know, hand him a briefcase full of cash, a newly elected president's office, hand him a briefcase full of cash, say you get to accept this and then you're gonna do what we tell you, or, uh, you know, you'll die, and you can make that choice. And now you can sit there and say, well, that's him dealing with a government official, but, and, and ultimately at the behest of another government, the United States government, even though he never worked for that government completely. Um, but the fact of the matter is their goal was to turn these countries over to corporate rule and to let big corpor American corporations in specific do whatever they wanted in those countries, i.e. ignore the law, ignore standards, ignore anything else that they wanted in order to get the oil or whatever it is that they wanted out of these countries. In other words, they went in to make the countries fundamentally lawless so that the large corporations can do whatever they want without any government oversight. So these large corporations, I mean, I guess you could say the corporations are only getting this amount of territory because these governments are letting them. But in the bottom, but, but the bottom line is these large corporate entities will be happy to go into some place with no government at all and institute slave trade and sla slave labor and completely ra ra rapacious policies toward the land. They want no government to stop them. They not want nobody to be able to stop them. And I don't whether they're whether these government whether these corporate entities are put together with government paperwork or not, they will come into existence. Somebody's got to be able to stop them. I I, I and I, I'm skeptical that guerrilla forces can usually do it because history has shown frequently that the guerrilla forces fail. Well, so that's well, kind of where I'm at. Well, first off, what's a corporation? Well. You can either define it as a, as a, you know, a paper entity put together by a government with, with specific rights and rules, but a corporation could be, I mean, you, you tell me what is a transnational corporation that's, that operates across multiple national boundaries. What is it? Does it only exist because of the state? A large business would be a corporation. That's my, uh, that, that's what I would, I would call a corporation. Well, I, right. don't know, I, don't know what, I don't know what large business means. Okay, let's say I have a business with 500,000 employees because I'm a very rich man and I have a business with 500,000 employees globally and I simply want one thing, no government to stop me from doing whatever I want to do. 
Um, I just I have my money. Okay. I have I have my people who work for me, who I pay. I have my income streams, and I want no government to bother me if I want to go into I don't know Guatemala and tear down ninety percent of the forest there and uh, just kick anybody off the lands that I want to. All right. Well, that's if you don't my corporation, and that's what I'm going to do. I don't give a crap about those horrible people living there. Screw them. Okay. Well, in that case, you wouldn't want U.S. soldiers to help topple the government or help coerce them. You wouldn't want them. You wouldn't want the United States government to also send soldiers to hold territory. You wouldn't want the United States to give you vast amounts in terms of both direct subsidies and tax breaks, as well as the tax breaks and like and liability that is weighed from you for being a corporation on paper. In addition, you won't get other subsidies in the form of special favoritism in the court. I mentioned liabilities earlier. So you're not really able to be held account to for your actions, even by people who would otherwise have a legitimate case. And more importantly, because you don't have, or because the government's not subsidizing anything, there's no way for the government of, say, Ecuador to be stopped in otherwise their opposition to you or even just the people of Ecuador who are going to be using their government to prevent their people from stopping you. So in essence, you would have to be shooting yourself into the foot to do something that your shareholders would no doubt be screaming bloody murder at your face, like literally kicking down the door to your off your office as CEO to stop you from doing because guess what? Armies are expensive. Training is expensive. The kind of warlordism that you're anticipating that a large business would undertake, it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And the only reason that it even happens today and has, had, has happened historically is because, one, the government gives these businesses enormous monopolies. This was seen especially historically with the East India Trading Company, where it was never profitable at any point in its history even though it was given vast amounts of subsidies by the British Empire. And you can see this with today. And, I mean, and it's, not one nearly, other... it's not nearly... I'm sorry, I wasn't finished. It's not nearly to the same extent that the East India Company was subsidized, but you can see very much the same thing today. Uh, no. Wasn't the East India Company uh, funded by the Bank of England? I... To the best of my knowledge, yes. And it was also given license by the British monarchy to basically be the only be the only company that is able to trade in the British Empire. And it was uh, never profitable at any point in its history. But yeah, uh just to add the filthy's point, like if it's, a company is doing something, say we're in in Kapistan right now, the company is doing something that I don't like, then I can easily go to their competitor, and boom, they lose money. More importantly, because they don't have a monopoly, they're going to have competitors nipping at their heels constantly. So what Thirsty said is absolutely accurate. What makes you think that I, I'm going to say I'm a sociopath, a brilliant sociopath with a very high IQ and no morals whatsoever. What is going to stop me from uh, starting my business and then simply begin to do monopolistic trade practices, um, which have been known for centuries on how you do them, without any state help at all to beat the crap out of, smear, kill, burn down my competitors. Um, because all of these have been done without state help by, by economic actors before. Well, you don't even have to do that if you have enough market force. If you have enough, you know, market recognition, you could just take over the market by buying up less, um, less, less producing businesses and make them, you know, that is a way that more than likely that would happen. Okay, okay. Uh, I monopoly I'm, would be Henry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, fashion. but I'm, I think we're getting caught in whataboutism. Okay. Okay. Uh, then I'll just give one more specific example. Henry Ford. No examples. No examples, please. This okay. is. I want to talk about principles, and we're worried about. Well, what about X? What about Y? What about Marauds? Okay. Well, if 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 the world is full of people who don't share your principles, what do your principles matter? That would be my point. If if people don't share your principles, they're they're kind of irrelevant. 
and there will always be people who don't accept your pro- your, your 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 principles because they have none. Well, that's or, a, that's. I'm sorry, you weren't finished. Yeah, I guess so. Sure. All right. Well, that's the beautiful thing about anarchism. They don't need to accept my principles. They just, it just needs to be in their economic interest to trade with me. Okay, and but then. <laughs> what if they decide it's in the, it's it's more in their economic interest to simply kill you and take your stuff? You're going to just assume that society, the market, will stop them? Of course. I mean, it's going to be in everybody's interest to want to be protected from violent thugs, and more importantly, anyone who does act as a violent thug is going to have a target on their back because guess what? They might be next. So of course, it's going to be in everybody's mutual best interest to protect each other. You don't need a government for that. And even if you do, like, all you're confessing is that you don't think it's necessary because it's going to be paid for via taxes. Uh, I guess so. I think even in a really primitive society, you know, if you and I are sharing a society and you and I get down to a, a dispute where neither one of us even agrees on what the facts are or, or who should win uh, an argument and, we, and it even starts to come to blows... I don't know. We're going to find a neutral arbiter that we both agree on. Um, of course. What if, we can't, what if we can't even both agree on a neutral arbiter? We'll um, be able. We'll, it's going to be in our mutual best interest to find an arbiter because sure. I'm going to have. I'm going to want one to find a case. Or I'm going to want one to rule on a case in my favor. You're going to want one to meet a case or rule on a case in your favor, and our interests are going to meet in the middle. It's the same thing with every economic transaction that goes on. A million times a day in this country, billions of times a day in this country, I would say, where what say rules? like I like say I want to buy a candy bar at the lowest price I possibly can. The vendor wants to sell that candy bar at the highest price I possibly can. Our interests are going to meet in the middle, and we're going to get a price that we both agree on. This is the nature of trade in general. And what is arbitration except another exchange? But what rules are are we going to be following in this society? Like, like, do, well, you, do you have any rules that you know would be enforced among all the uh, all the communities? Well, first off, you're operating under the assumption that rules need to be enforced. That is to say, positive action needs to be taken to apply them. And I'm saying that that's actually not going to be necessary. I mean, I think Max brought up a great point earlier when he said, "It's like, what are we?" What happens if we're in a dispute and we need to figure out what the rules are? The question is, what can you objectively prove? What facts can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt? What claims can you make that you can back up? And this, and from this, we can derive from from, from this. I think the qu- question of what rules we would follow, we would naturally have to arrive at uh, natural law. That is to say, the system of objective ethics that me and Shane Killian have both outlined in our videos before, where you have the non-aggression principle, because we can objectively prove that through, what's it called? Through the burden of proof. And you can also prove, what's it called? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on these terms right now. But uh, self-ownership, and from self-ownership, we derive property rights. What keeps the might might makes right people from manipulating that the fact that they're they can't objectively prove their claims well you don't really need to objectively prove your claims when you have guns well who's to say that they even have the most might well i mean i already established that if they are operating under a might makes right principle then they're no doubt operating through an incredibly centralized and inefficient bureaucracy so naturally, they're going to have a severe disadvantage against any sort of uh, less centralized organization that is going to be in their interest to defend against them. Not necessarily. I mean, you know, me, me personally, my t- my form of government would be more volunteerism. Either you work towards the the good of of all of everybody that lives under it, or you don't. And if you don't, nothing really happens to you. You're just, you have to make your own way. Well, I mean, I agree with that. The trouble is, like, we're gonna, I think 
we're at the point where we're going to be quibbling over terms a little bit. I mean, no offense, but yeah, I mean, you, voluntarism and the government are mutually exclusive entities. I don't think they are. Well, here's next question then. Would your system have taxation? Yes, because uh, it is not theft. All right, so next question, and I'm only asking this because I have encountered this before. Do our people required to pay taxes? Only if they want any type of benefit from the government whatsoever. So basically they pay... So let's assume this. Suppose the IRS gives you a form every year. It's like a checklist. And you pay for what you want to benefit from the government with and don't pay for what you don't want to pay. And you pay that amount in taxes. That would be agreeable, yes. Yeah, that's uh, that's basically just... A, and at that point, it ceases to become a government and it's a business. I disagree with that entirely because a government is... Because there's still rules, there's still laws that that, that government enforces. Well, government, I mean, laws and rules exist independent of government. You can go to a swimming pool, they're going to have rules. You can go to any place of business, they're going to have laws. And you have the laws of physics, for example. You don't need a government to enforce that, those already exist. I mean, I agree that the system that you have in mind of a form of voluntary taxation where people pay for what they want to pay for is not only voluntary, but pre preferable. Not just voluntary taxation, but voluntary uh, citizenship. Like, if you're not a citizen, you can't vote. We, and that keeps the, the major problem from our co government, which is run by the people of the majority vote, who are all controlled by the mainstream media. So you, you the, the problem we're having with our current government is too many people who do not, you know, keep up with their responsibilities. To, to be in the know, to have the knowledge about what, what the government is doing, you know, they're completely failing on their part. And in a large part, that's because of laziness. And I don't think people will get any less lazy with, without a, with or without a government. It, it's, I think we still have the problem of corruption and nepotism without a government. Mm -hmm. We still have you know all the problems that we're seeing right now that we're all that a lot of people are blaming on the government i think it's more because of humans no matter what system we put together it's going to end up like the system we're in now because the system we're in now is is much like the system that we broke away from england from in 1776 you could argue it's even worse because they the the boston tea party was engaged in because of like a 1% value added tax on tea which was one a commodity which is one a very small amount of money especially for the time and two uh, a commodity that people could easily you know not pay for and rather as today you have like a 30 40 percent income tax depending on your brackets that you're required to pay for no matter what unless you sign unless you fail to sign the 1040 form what wait what <laughs> but anyways uh, the uh, uh sorry uh I, I no go ahead uh just question uh, is your system is it like is it gonna be against the law to compete with the government well compete in the government in what sense exactly. uh Make i guess say you had a health care system and you decided to compete with the government uh against the health care system are you elected? I do not believe in a government controlled health care system I think it should stay you know private how about this private entities but with regulation on the market so how, how about this that it is that everybody gets a fair shake something that we don't get right now but the regulations that we have right now are all useless well how about this then uh would you be allowed to compete with the police department like set up your own private security firm and they would do the exact same thing the police does of course this is a system of voluntary taxation so you can yeah. not pay your taxes to you can voluntarily not pay your taxes to the police and instead subscribe to the private security. Well, it, that exists today. Yeah, that that well, exists in today's day and age. There are, you know, 
Yeah, there are some cities that have this type of system. We we do have security companies. Some of the biggest biggest uh, security firms do private security. They, they're essentially private armies. We have a whole bunch of private armies operating within U.S. soil right now that are not under control of government, but under control of business. Well, so I don't think that that would be much of a problem in, in either case if we were to break down a lot of the laws, which there's not a lot of them. Um, you know, if a city wanted to just use a, a you know, company instead of being being in charge of, of law enforcement, they can do that now. It's not really, you know, they just have to follow a, a certain, they still have to be, you know, officers of the court. They still and, have to do all that. Yes, sorry, but the, uh, I was saying that because you were right. There are municipalities that do subscribe to private security rather than traditional police departments. However, it's the city, you're still required to pay for taxes for it. Whereas in this alternative system of competition, you have two different police departments or even say 20, just let's be crazy here, all competing with the police, to, all competing with the police and individuals can simply choose not to pay taxes for that police department and instead subscribe to those systems or none at all. Would that be legal? Well, that depends on, you know, whether or not they're lawful or unlawful. Like the the whole the whole premise of good and bad that you're talking about. Um, I don't I do not actually believe the good and evil thing is, is what the law is. The law is what is good, you know, in terms of you know what does not cause harm to people, and what is bad is what causes harm. So then the you agree with the non-aggression principle. Well, I, yes, but I don't think everybody would follow it. I, I think that you would have to, you know, for the non-aggression principle to work, everybody would have to agree to follow it. I don't think everybody would. Well, I don't believe any, everybody would follow it either. Otherwise, this entire discussion about how rules should be protected and how people should be defended would be pointless, wouldn't it? My point is that I think it's more ethical to have individuals voluntarily figure out how to do this for themselves. They might do it through a traditional security firm or some form of uh, rights defense organizations people have talked about in the past. It could be through some other mechanism that none of us have either have even conceived of yet. But the point is that people should be able to figure this out voluntarily. And of course, we can't derive right and wrong from what is lawful and unlawful, since that is fundamentally completely arbitrary. Well, I, I don't know that we're going to wind up agreeing on, on, on everything here, although we all agreed on what we would like. I know we're past the 40-minute mark, so we'll probably be wrapping this up soon. I, I just uh, I, I just wind up first off I don't even accept the non-aggression principle I don't I don't think the non-aggression principle is useful or defensible um, and and I don't think it's internally coherent because it ultimately relies on too many subjective values within it I think that it is absolutely a given that in any system without a government a government will automatically uh, by default form itself by whoever's got the biggest guns and the biggest will to to create one and that you know the world is full of example of examples of wealthy individuals operating above the law um, and and doing whatever they want and so I, I I guess that gets down to it and I can't think of what more I would add I think uh, in recognizing that no matter what principles you have there will people who flagrantly don't give a damn and will happily violate them and not care what kind of reputation they get from it, I think that, that there's always going to be enough such individuals that people will be forced to create some kind of formal government or they'll have an informal government. I just think that's what's going to happen. And so I would rather talk about prudent forms of governance. Um, and that's just kind of where I'm at. I, I can't think of what else I would add. Did you want to say something, Sean? I guess that's a no. <laughs> I guess not. Thirsty, you want to say something? Uh, I guess... Uh, 
I'm not really too much uh, educated on the whole first pr principles. I know a little bit, but I still need to uh, research that, which I know coming from an ANCAP, that's, whoa, I'm, never mind. But basically, uh, I would say, uh, pay, uh, like, yes, there will be a few bad, bad eggs in, in Kapistan, but, like, overall, I believe that, like, we'll have, like, private militia groups protecting us. Like, if you value your uh, security, I guess, then it's profitable. profitable. And if it's profitable, then uh, you can easily buy it from some company. And uh, I guess... What I'm trying to say is, uh, I guess there would be private security everywhere on uh, every, uh, not every, but like there would be a lot of private security on uh, like most properties. Could be wrong. All right. I don't, I don't really see the difference between the philosophy of a constitutional republic, which is what I, I am trying to defend, and anarchism. Well, first off, your system is going to have rulers. I mean, you've already said that there will be laws and regulations in the same time that there will be voluntary taxation, in which case people will be able to move, simply not fund those laws and regulations. I mean, one thing I was meaning to ask is, under your system of voluntary taxation, could people opt out of being subject to laws and regulations through not paying taxes for it? Um, that, I, I would say that depends on the state and the city. Uh, the, it, really, actual, it really shouldn't. It really shouldn't, because well, this is this, a question of universal principle, not uh, subjective law. Well, it, it is. It is universal principle, though. It, it's so, what the people within that that city, county, and state actually want. The federal government only should exist to make sure the market is fair through regulation and to be accountable to the people, to the to the people, and the people who uh, they're accountable to are the voters. Um, everybody else can, if they don't want to be part of that government, then they're free not to be part of that government. But if everybody else in the state wants to be, but, they're going to have to talk to the people that they live around first. But could, but could I opt out? Could I, as an individual, opt out? Forget about what everyone around me else is doing. What um, Could I opt out? You could. So you, uh, just like you can, you could now. There's multiple different ways you you can opt out of, of being a United States citizen. Well, I can't opt you, out. Well, not if you want to live here. No, that's my point. The the fact that I can't opt out indicates that this is fundamentally coercive. That I that positive action is required on my part to deny something that I did not consent to in the first place. I didn't give these people the right to make okay. rules and regulations on my behalf. I didn't say that it was okay. They didn't consent, or they didn't get my consent, or even ask my opinion when they decided that, hey, you okay. know what? You should abide by these rules. Let me, uh, let me give you a thought experiment. I establish a community um, of, I don't know, Catholic anarchists. And I establish a, a, a community of Catholic anarchists, and in my private community, the requirements for you to join our community and come live among us is that you be a Catholic and you play the rosary every day and you go to daily mass with everybody in our, in our community, because that's what we do in Catholic and Kapistan, and that's our requirement for you to live in our community. Um, now, you're born in our community and you reach the age of 18 and you say, I no longer consent to live under the rules of Catholic and Kapistan. Um, don't the people of Catholic and Kapistan have a right to say, that's fine, get out? No. Why not? No. Really? You don't, you don't have the right to impose those rules in the first place. So I can't establish a community? I'm, if not, I saying can't, I'm not saying you can't establish a community, but you're, at the, you're, starting, you're approaching the point where you become coercive. At which but point if, you don't have well, a, you don't have a legitimate I have, defense. I ha no, I do. I legitimately want to live in a co uh, in, in a community where only Catholics live, and I don't want to live in a community with any non-Catholics in it. And I want them out. Okay. Uh, and, if, and, uh, if, and that's if, what I want. You know, that's what I want, and that's what the other people with me want. Okay. No non-Catholics here. That's what we want. And mm -hmm. everybody prays the Rosary every day. That's our rules. If you don't like it, get out. Mm -hmm. How is that not okay? How is it okay? 
it, it's not a question. The burden of proof is not on him. The question of burden, burden of proof is on who are you to tell them to do it. If they legitimately own their property, if they have a justification for staying there, then you don't have a, then it's not well, up to you. Well, in, in this, in this, in this thought experiment, I, I'm assuming that everybody in the community, you know, agrees to these these rules that you can only own property if you agree to these rules. Right. And if you're born into this and you don't agree to these to this rules, you don't have to stay there. You can go elsewhere. Now, with our with 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 our current system, it's kind of like that, but you have to buy out. And it's kind of a bullshit system. I, I would def most definitely agree with that. And the sovereign citizen, um, IRS, one hundred and fifty thousand that they give you, that's that's bullshit. You know, um, you know that. But because that that comes with strings attached, if you, if you decide to come back with you, with your the tail with your tail between your legs. But th there are options currently. But in, in in the society that I'd more want, that I'm more trying to work towards, is more of a reforming our, our current society more down to very basic, you know, government has very limited role. And what the community decides, you know, and it, the most important part is what the majority in a city, county, and state, like the city would be the 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 ultimate thing you know if, if you just made a city that it was like the the main you know here are the values that everybody agree, agrees on we, we'll, we'll call it a constitution and it's written down and you know once you get to a certain age you're taught you're taught these values your entire life once you get to a certain age you can say no but then you won't be able to be able to live there you'd have to live somewhere else but it, it doesn't really matter because it's it, they're not saying, you know, um, only if you can live here. They're, they're not saying you, you can't live. Period. If you do not follow these things, I think there's a big difference in that. I don't think that's all that coercive. Well, think about it like this: Do you have? Should you have the right to defend yourself against aggression? Sure. Physical aggression, yes. Aggression in general. This can, this, can not, this not only implies physical aggression, but also I, indirect I aggression through coercion. I only I only accept physical aggression. So, um, as so, aggression. Peop, so you can't so people can't threaten you. I don't actually I don't view that as aggression. Yeah. It, it is it is aggressive behavior, but it's not aggression until action is made. So fraud is not aggression. Fraud is an action. Fraud is also an action, but uh, aggression is action as well. well yes, but I, I, th is, I think so. That do so I, do I people have the right? So do people have the right to defend themselves against aggression? Yes, as long as it is physical force against physical force. If it's mental force, you know, then you have every right to. But that's not aggression. That's a discussion. That's Can very much an aggression because it's it's a threat. It's an implied threat of force. I have another stream that I have to do within the next few minutes, so um, hopefully we can either wrap this up or, or, or I'll just drop off. We're going to be doing a stream over on the Red Pill Religion stream with Josh Brister about his recent debate with T-Jump. So maybe we could uh, wrap this up, or, or sure. should I just drop off? Sure, let's wrap this up. Um, want to make your closing statements? Uh, I would just say, I, I think I may have even made it with my last statement. I think some sort of state will inevitably evolve no matter what you do ever. It will simply happen. It'll only be a question of whether it's formal or informal. And that to me is why anarchism fails. That's where I'm at. For me, statism and government in general has been an experiment for the last 5,500 years whose results have just been endless procession of death, destruction, misery, murder, and just absolute abject human horror. If people are good, it makes no sense to have a government. If people are evil, then you don't dare give them a government by which they could inflict their cruelty upon others. It makes no sense by any reasonable standard that you would have a government and why one would even be preferable. It's just going to always make things worse. It's always going to make things less efficient. It's always going to slow down the pros 
the progress of society and the only problem that's really holding people back i think is that they can't that they've spent so long in a society where 5500 years of indoctrination where very few people if any have ever lived in a world without a government that they have trouble of conceiving how very simple things are done without a government and you can see this with places like colorado when they repealed the law that required gas stations to pump gas for people you had people all over social media saying like without the government how are we going to get our gas pumped it's the same exact question Without the government, how are we going to defend ourselves? Without the government, who's going to build the roads? Without the government, who is going to brush our teeth? We need to figure these things out for ourselves. We need to be, for the first time in human history, since 5,500 years, and I know I keep repeating <coughs> that point, but it's very important, we should be free. And we have the means to do this. Cryptocurrency, agorism, counter counter economy and the gray markets this is how we do this we don't need to ask for the state's permission to be free anymore and it is going to happen one way or another because a system that cannot mathematically sustain itself will not and it's only a question of when and whether or not you yourself are able to prepare for what's probably going to come in the next five years i mean have you guys seen the everything bubble Well, uh, I guess that's it for the stream. Uh, I guess have a great night, you guys. Yep. Thanks for the discussion, by the way. I did enjoy it. I really enjoyed being on. I hope we can do it again. It was great, guys. Thanks a lot. And if anybody wants to join us, we'll be joining Master Apologist on the Red Pill Religion channel in a few minutes. Uh, Colby, quick question before you go: When are you going to make oh. the video? When are you going to make the video responding to Libertarian First Principles? Um, I haven't, uh, you know, send it to me and I'll do a response. As an ex-libertarian, it should be an interesting exercise for me. I mean, when it, I don't know if it's you specifically, but I know some guy has been saying that they wanted to do a reply to first principles, specifically the burden of proof argument. Um, okay. Um, since I, I yeah, I, I haven't looked at it, so I can't say. I'm always, I'm always skeptical when okay. somebody says the words burden of proof because it's always a question of burden of proof to whom. But, you know, that said, sure, send it to me. I'll consider doing a response to it. All right. My, my right. mistake. I thought I thought that was you. It must have been someone else. Okay. Yep. All Stop right, the stream. Thanks a lot, everybody. I, 